tuned in on the phone line and those who are tuned in on Facebook. We're grateful for your presence. It's exciting, actually. I know part of us could say it's sad or pitiful, but the reality is to be able to still worship God, even as we're separate from one another, is a special thing. So I pray that while you're at home or while you're in your car at work, wherever you are, that you would just remember that God is everywhere. This building is a place to be congregated, but God is everywhere, and he's everywhere at the same time. And so we're knit together uh, in love, even as we're separate from one another in a physical presence. I want to thank everyone at St. Peter Missionary Baptist Church this week who have uh, joined us every Sunday, every night rather, at 7 o'clock p.m. as we have uh, heard a word from the Lord regarding expectation. As a matter of fact, the title is the Lord gave it to me last Sunday, Sunday morning, uh, Living in Expectation in an Unexpected Time. So we know that our theme for this year is Living in Expectation. And I believe that God uh, has, has placed us in this unique situation not to destroy us but to perfect us and strengthen us to to challenge us that we may grow more and more stronger in him and so the key element of this reality is what will we do during this season as god does what god is doing in his own way and so my thoughts and my uh, my scriptural studies have brought me to the point that the most important thing that a child of god can do today is we uh, find ourselves isolated, self-quarantined, not at work, not playing, not socializing. What we can do more than anything else is use this time to draw closer to God. Jeremiah said it uh, to those uh, in Israel. He reminded them that the reality was that they were going to be in captivity. He said, but look here, when you're in captivity, don't despair, don't give up. Use that time to draw closer to the Lord. And so I say that the same thing to us today. Some of us may feel like we're in captivity, but I challenge you not to allow this, this time to push you away from the Lord, but use this time to draw closer and closer to the Lord that you may learn more about Him and that you may draw closer to Him in every aspect of your life. I'm going to even open now with prayer. I thank God for the praise team and the wonderful work they did in bringing us all throughout this city and even throughout some other states that are on the line. Home today, I can see some of them who's on the line already and some of who already is on Facebook. You not even, Some of y'all not enjoying, but we're grateful for your presence this morning. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we come this morning just to say again, thank you. We thank you for the grace. We thank you for the mercy. We thank you for the joy. And we thank you for the peace that you have made available to us through Jesus Christ our Lord. God, because you say that we are to give thanks in everything, we give thanks even right now for what's taking place in our world. Because we know that you're not only over it, but you're all around it and you have it all under control. We thank you, Lord, for the time that you've given us now, Lord, to, to focus more on you. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity you have given us now, Lord, to, to pray more and to study more and to worship on our own more, Lord, that we may grow stronger in you and draw closer to you. God, we pray as we open up this worship and open up the scriptural part of this study, we pray, God, that you would open up our hearts and minds wherever we are. If we land in the bed, Lord, sit us up. If we're at work, Lord, give us a moment where we can focus on you. Lord, if we're at home in the den, wherever we are, Lord, draw our hearts and minds, Lord, from a mundane place to a spiritual place, Lord, that we would hear from you. And God, we got to ask you to do this. Empty the preacher out. Get him out of the way. Fill him up, Holy Spirit, that this morning and during this time, your word would go forth with power and clarity. That when we close out, when we shut off our phones, our iPads and computers, when we hang up our phones, that we will know without a doubt that you are sovereign and powerful all by yourself. That we would trust in you more than we've ever trusted you before. And that we would live in the victory that is already ours in Jesus Christ. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Wherever you are, you just say thank you, Lord, and amen. 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 We're going to study and sojourn just a little while today in the book of Matthew chapter 11. I I think those who are on the call in number already know uh, we're in the book of Matthew chapter 11. And as, as you turn to those, turn to chapter 11 of Matthew. I just want to highlight a few things during the course of the week. We have this week already, for those of you who did not know, every night on our call in line, we are doing a, about a 30 we've been on average about 30 minutes where we talk about uh, living in expectation, unexpected times, the tools of living in expectation in unexpected times, what we need to live in an expectation in unexpected times. And so we have sojourned in Jeremiah, Proverbs, uh, we've been in the Psalms, we've been in Joshua, we've been in Jeremiah twice. Uh, we have had a great time, I believe, in, in hearing these words from the Lord and give us insight into the time in which we live and give us understanding and what we must do. But most of all, give us expectation about what God is doing during this season. And so this morning, we're going to take our time and move into the book of Matthew, chapter 11. And we're going to focus just about on three verses, chapter 28, 29, and 30. But I want
want you to keep your Bibles open because we never know where the Lord will take us. Uh, we recognize that this book of Matthew was written um, by Matthew, and we recognize that he wrote this account of the life of Jesus Christ primarily focused on those uh, Hebrew, Hebrew believers, those Jewish individuals who had come to Christ. And he wrote using certain things that would... Um, allow them to understand to have a connection because he used a lot of Old Testament prophecy to show a few things. First of all, uh, that Jesus is in fact the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. He did that so that they would understand that Jesus was not an interloper, but instead it was coming to fulfill all that had been promised in the Old Testament. And so as we go through the book of Matthew, what we began to see uh, is that Matthew is presenting this, this message of Christ as Christ as the King. Uh, he has shown how Jesus has authority over everything, and Jesus has all authority over the physical elements and everything else. And so as he moves forward in this gospel account of Christ, we get to chapter 11, and we find something interesting happen, because in chapter 11, we immediately find out that John the Baptist has some questions. Uh, the Bible lets us know that John the Baptist was the forerunner of Christ, that John the Baptist's purpose for coming was to prepare the way of the coming of the Lord. And so as Jesus had come and as Jesus' ministry grew, we find that John the Baptist had been locked up in jail. And as J John was in the prison, what he began to hear was all the things that were going on outside of jail by the power of the Lord. And so he did ask his disciples, he said, would well, y'all go to Jesus and find out from Jesus, in fact, uh, is he the Messiah or should we look for another? Now, I can imagine that the reason why John the Baptist asked that question was because here it was, all that he had come to prepare the way, and now that he was there and everything was taking place, all of a sudden, he was no longer relevant. He was locked up in jail, and so he wanted to know, was in fact Jesus the Christ or was that someone else? And Jesus answered by his disciples by simply saying, tell John um, what's going on. Show John what's going on. Let him know what's being done and so that he may understand. Jesus told them, he said, the blind are receiving their sight and the lame walk and the lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And I can imagine even as he was in jail, uh, John the Baptist realized that that was what was supposed to happen. He didn't worry about his situation anymore. He just celebrated the fact that what he had come to say and what he had come to prepare was now taking place. And so as we continue through this chapter 11, we see that in verse 7 that Jesus uh, began to preach it to the multitudes and he began to preach and, 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 and prepare and, and, and teach and share all the way through to verse 20. But verse 20, the times changed because then Jesus' ministry became more of a chastening ministry for this period of time because the Bible says in verse 20, of chapter 11 that, that Jesus began to upgrade the cities wherein he had done most of his mighty works. In other words, when Jesus got to places where he had already healed the sick and raised the dead, he began to chastise them because even though they had seen his power, even though they had seen his actions, his ministry, they had seen demonstrations of what he could do, most of them did not repent and come to follow him. They became spectators. They did not uh, see Jesus and come crying out, what must I do to be saved? Instead, they came, saw, and went back home. And so Jesus chastised these cities because of their insolence and their arrogance and their unwillingness to repent and come to a right relationship uh, with God through Jesus Christ. And so here they are. Here they are. They're, they're, Jesus is now talking to Capernaum. He's speaking uh, with clarity. He's speaking with power. He's speaking with authority. And finally, in verse 25, uh, Jesus said and uh, began a prayer. He said in verse 25 of chapter 11, he says, I thank your Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and has revealed them unto babes. He says, even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Jesus said this prayer uh, and to his Father, even as he stood among the people that were standing around. But that wasn't the end. When Jesus prayed, Jesus' prayer was one to, for a call to action, not just for his action, for, uh, from an action for those he was praying for. Because the next words that Jesus said after he had prayed, after he had chastised those who had not come, after he had uh, had this, this dissertation discussion with John the Baptist, I mean, sorry, um, yeah, John the Baptist, Baptist's um, disciples, Jesus made this request in verse 28. He says, come unto me. And I like to pause here, this part right here. Jesus said, come unto me. In other words, he's saying some folk out there that he was preaching to and had seen his miraculous power did not know how to approach him because they felt there was some gulf between them and this opportunity to come to God. They, they did not understand. Some of them did not want to, but some of them did, but just could not get themselves in the mindset to come 
unto the Lord. And so Jesus made this request and he extended and I can picture Jesus standing there, uh, standing up with his arms wide open in my, in my spiritual mind and he made this invitation come unto me. Now, I want to be very clear. Jesus knew his audience. His audience was frustrated with the, the yoke of, of, of tradition. They were frustrated with the yoke of the government oppression. They were frustrated with all that was going on around them. And so those who wanted to come, those who had a desire for a changed circumstance or a changed situation, um, that's who Jesus was talking to. And likewise today, uh, that Jesus' request and Jesus' invitation still lives today for all those who are in situations or circumstances or feel trapped, feel depressed, feel like there is no one there for who feel alone. Jesus makes this same uh, invitation. He says, come unto me. Now, let me pause and slow down just for a minute. Come unto me is not just a uh, Jesus' call for action, but it's also Jesus' extension of his compassion for all those, his people. That's what it is. It's a call to action, but it's also a call of compassion. Jesus didn't say it just because he needed some more followers. He said it because he knew people stood in need of the comfort which only he could give. And so I speak this right here to somebody who's at home right now, who's feeling isolated, who's feeling alone, who feel like you have no one there. Jesus is saying to you out of his compassion for you, come to me. Don't try anything else. Don't waste your time calling folk on the phone. Don't waste your time sharing your, your anger and your angst and your anguish to somebody else. Bring whatever it is that's troubling you to me. He says, come to me. He's, a, it's, it, he's not saying with conditionally. Jesus didn't say, come to me, but you got to bring some money with you. I got to pause and tell this quick story. I was looking at TV yesterday and a guy was saying, hey, I can get all these things for you, but you, all you need to do is send a self-addressed envelope with a check in it and then you can get all these blessings. Jesus didn't say that. He said, if you're just willing to come to me, I have everything you need. Then he moves on to, to qualify the specific specificity of who he's calling. He's saying, come to me. That's the invitation. Come to me. Wherever you are, come to me. Whatever you've done, come to me. Whatever you've been through, come to me. Wherever you messed up at, come to me. But then he says specifically, he says, all. What a word. All. He says, come to me all. Everybody. Don't, doesn't matter your background, doesn't matter who you're related to, don't matter uh, what you got. He says, come to me all ye. Here's the two operative words. Ye that labor. Let's look at labor for a minute. Labor is not just work. And somebody says, well, I labor at work every day. But labor is work without fruit. It's work as you're just working and you're going through the motions. You're existing. But there's nothing coming out of your life. There's nothing coming through you, to you, or out of you. And and, and, folk, and some of us know folks. Some, some of us have been in that situation ourselves. And some of us know folk like that. They run. They push. They hustle. They do all these things. But at the end of the day, they find themselves just tired. They they give their best, but their best is not lined up with what God's will is. And as a result, there's a sense of emptiness as a result of the work that bears no fruit. Picture this. Picture going out to your garden and, plant, and digging up the ground and toiling the soil and planting seeds and putting the dirt back on the seeds and fertilizing the seeds and making sure the seeds get all the rain. But at the season, when it's time for fruit to be born, you go out there and all you have is a bunch of weeds. That would get you, make you tired. And the truth is, in so many lives of folk in the church and out the church, that's what's happening because the seeds that are planted are not the seeds that God intended. So how do you do that? You have to come unto the Lord. Jesus says, all you that labor. That's the first group. The second group is those that are heavy laden. That means that are burdened down with the cares of the world. Labor for those who are working, but there's no, there's no fruit. Heavy laden is those who are burdened down by the things of the world, by friendships and relationships that have failed, that are burdened down by jobs that don't, don't pan out, burdened down by, by, by opportunities that did not pan out, burdened down, just feel exhausted because it seems like the weight of the world is on your shoulders. Jesus says, I'm specifically talking to this crowd of folk. Folk who are trying but can't seem to get it right. And, I, and Jesus, now we, we got to hold on to and, and swing to this next verse to really get for it to come home clearly. But Jesus says, I want to be target who I'm talking to. And this is not that some folk are embarrassed to admit that you've been in this situation. But the reality is, in order for you to come unto the Lord to get what you need, you have to at least be transparent and honest with yourself. Say, here, I am. I tried, but it didn't work out. I've given my best, I think, but it didn't pan out. I'm heavy laden. I'm burdened. When I go to bed, I'm more exhausted. And when I wake up, up, I'm tired than I was when I went to bed. He, Jesus is saying, those who are labor and are heavy laden, here's what his promise is, I will give you rest. So let me do a, 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 a calculation. Jesus says, come unto me, and I will give you rest. Look at that. Jesus says, come unto me. If you come to me, I will give you rest. Jesus says, I won't, I won't offload it to somebody else. I won't create a committee to give you rest. Jesus says, I will give you rest myself if you simply come to me. Now, 
in verse 29 is where there's a nice trigger point because for the, those who are reading this book of Matthew, for those who are hearing these words, for those that were being preached to and taught at this time, the reality was their biggest issue was the tradition, the yoke of tradition. Uh, the, the Jewish tradition was one of, 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 of constant uh, work, but there was never any relationship. They, they had to do uh, ritual and ritual and ritual and ritual, but there was never any burst of relationship as a result of the ritual. They were tired of going through the motions but not receiving the relationship that they sought truly for God in their lives. They, they wanted something to happen, but the yoke was heavy. It was a bitter yoke. And, they, and compounded with that was the yoke of the government. It was the yoke that the government taxed and the government required and the government requested, but there was still never any participation of those who were taxed by the government. Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. In other words, Jesus says, instead of, of, of being battened down and, and beat down by the yoke of traditional religion, Jesus is saying, take my yoke upon you. This is an individual relationship I'm offering you and learn of me. Jesus said, if you take, if you come to me, you will learn of me and you will learn something about me. You will learn that I am meek, is what Jesus says, and lowly in heart. In other words, Jesus says, and, and this is interesting. I'm always finding this interesting. Jesus said this. He says, look, if you learn about me, if you come to me, if you learn about me, if you take the time to submit yourself to me and learn about me, what you will find out, first of all, is I could be arrogant, but I'm not because I'm not interested in having lording over people. I'm interested in having a relationship with people. One of the things that I find interesting about uh, folk in power, a lot of folk in power want to be in power so that they have people under them. They don't, they, don't, uh, they don't want power so they can have people with them. They want people under them. What Jesus is offering is not a, another situation where they're being oppressed. Jesus is offering an opportunity for a relationship where there's some give and some take, some communion and some communication. And so Jesus said, if you, if you come to me, what you do is you will learn and find out that I am meek and lowly in heart. In other words, I'm going to be who you're looking for to connect to. Sometimes in this, in this, we, we share things with our friends because we think our friends share our situation, our condition. And sometimes we don't share what we could share with somebody it's because we think they'll look down on us. When Jesus is saying, I'm not going to look down on you because I know what you're going through because I have suffered as well. And Jesus said, I know what you've been through because I've been through the same thing as well. But here's what Jesus says that we find out later in Hebrews. Jesus says, I've been through it, but I didn't fall for it. And as a result of me not falling for it, I can help you in your situation. Jesus said, I'm meek and lowly in heart. And here's the promise. Jesus has already promised that I will give you rest. But then Jesus says, not only will I give you a level of physical rest, I, not only will I take away those things that will prevent you from finding physical rest, but Jesus says, ye shall find rest unto your souls. Look at this right here. Two types of rest. Now, let's think about it for a moment. First of all, Jesus says, I will give you rest. Jesus says, all of the physical activity that you engage in during the course of a day, Jesus says, you're tired. And sometimes you can't. Un un relax. You can't un unhook. You can't disconnect from all the other stuff. And I know some of us know what I'm talking about. You're so frustrated from your day because somebody said something or somebody did something or somebody didn't do something or somebody didn't say something that you find yourself tossing and turning, worrying about what did or did not happen. Jesus says, I'll disconnect. I'll, I'll take that from you and I'll put it somewhere else so you can get physical rest. But Jesus says, more than physical rest, I will give you rest unto your souls. I'll give you rest so that you know daily that you are not by yourself. You will know daily that I'm walking with you and talking with you. Jesus says, I'm going to give you something that allows you to know that no matter where you are, I'm right there by your side. Jesus says, I'm going to make it so that your soul is at rest. One of the things we talked about um, when I think it was Wednesday or Thursday night in the book of Psalms was that the psalmist was saying that David was saying that, that he was going to tell his soul to be silent. He said, I want my soul to be silent where, so that God can fully have his way uh, in my life. I want my soul to be silent. I don't want my soul complaining. I don't want my soul um, 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 murmuring. I don't want my soul excited and agitated. He even went to the far and said he was going to tell his soul to be silent because he wanted his soul to be in a place to experience and receive what God had. Jesus said here, he said, I'm going to do that for you. 
I'm going to make it so that your soul is at rest and, and peace and there is no internal frustration, there is no, eter it, no, no eternal, internal rather, internal frustration or internal conflict. Instead, you feel my presence and my presence alone grants you rest unto your souls. I don't know about you, but in this particular season, there's nothing better than have a soul at rest in the Lord. While everything else is going on around us, while we get um, 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 bad news look like daily, every day there's another report of another case of coronavirus, every day there's another uh, case of, of, of death of coronavirus, every day there's some um, somebody giving false news or false uh, prophecy or somebody saying something that isn't or might not be and, and it causes us to have conflict and we begin to ask the question, oh what will I do? But I stopped by here, St. Peter at the church, to tell you all wherever you are, that if you're just doing this season, come unto Jesus. Now let me pause. Somebody's saying, well I'm already in Christ. Well, coming unto Jesus is not a one time thing, it's a daily thing. If you go to work, if you work a job, you don't go one day and just get your check the rest of the time. You have to do what? Go in and go in and go in every day to get your check. Likewise, it's the same with Jesus. Make the start of your day a, a, a movement to come unto Jesus, to draw closer unto him. Let your coming unto Jesus be done daily, every day. Let this be our priority, particularly in this season, while we are find ourselves um, somewhat um, uh, limited on our movements. Let your day start so that you can get in the habit of coming to Jesus every day. So that as you come to Jesus, you will find him. As you come to Jesus, you will get rest for your physical body. But even as you come to Jesus, you'll get rest for your a spiritual body, your soul will be at rest because you will know that you know that you know that God has full power and control and authority over everything. Let me tell you how that might look. When you look at the turn the news on and you see the president, you you can mute the button. You can just turn it clean off if you want to and instead of hearing that, you will hear what the Lord is saying to you. When you turn on the news and you hear somebody with a somber face and a solemn face telling you how bad things are, you will know that it may be bad now, but you also know that the God you serve and who you have a relationship with is in control of everything that is taking place. It means that when you go to bed at night, you won't go to bed worried about the next day, but you'll go to bed knowing that the same person who brought you through that day is the person who's going to bring you through the days to come. It'll look a little bit like this. It'll be like instead of you having a frown on your face because of where you are and what you're doing, you'll have a smile on your face and you'll find yourself rejoicing in the Lord because you will know that God is, God is, that he is everything that we need, and not in just, just this season, but in the seasons to come. I believe without a doubt that during this season, God has called his people, first of all, to draw closer to him. And second of all, he has called us to share with others the necessity of drawing close to him so that we can, in fact, enjoy the fullness of the Lord in every aspect of our lives. Don't take it for granted. Find yourself, instead of, whenever you feel that complaint coming on, find yourself drawing to Jesus by through your prayers, through your praise, through your worship, and through your study of his word. As we do these things, we will find rest. We will find rest into our souls, and we will find out that Jesus' yoke is easy and his burden is light. He will carry us. He will strengthen us. He will hold us. He will sustain us all by his power. I'm grateful for this time that God has given us this day to sojourn in this scripture, and I pray that this day we will not attribute it to anything else in the necessity just to come to Jesus ourselves individually as, a, as, as Christians and then come to Jesus if you're not saved today is a good day to be saved today is a good day to come into a right relationship with God through Jesus Christ so let me pray this prayer if you're at home and you're not saved if you would just repeat these words to you at home if you're not saved just repeat these words God I come to you right now knowing full well that I can't do it by myself I know full well that I have struggled, I have strove, I strived, I have wrestled, I have fought, but I realize that my power is limited. But now, God, I realize that your power is unlimited. I come to you. God, I confess with my mouth that I believe without a doubt that Jesus died for my sins and that God raised him from the dead. And I believe it in my heart right now. I am looking for a change, Lord, and I know the change is only coming through you. So if you're at home, say those words right now so that you may move to that place of salvation so that you can have a soul at rest in a world of unrest so you can have a soul at peace in a world of frustration 
And I pray this prayer for all the believers. Father God, I pray right now for the believers at St. Peter Baptist Church and all those believers who are here with us this day. I pray God right now that you would grant us peace and joy and the knowledge that you are in control. And I pray, God, that during this season of, of limitation, that you would allow us to have an unlimited experience with you. I pray, God, that daily as we wake up in the morning, for those of us who have prayed all our lives and have somewhat fallen off because of the, 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 the pace of this world, God, help us now to refocus ourselves, to get in the habit again of coming unto you every day of our lives. I pray, God, that you would draw us closer to you during this season so that when this season is over, when, when, when we have come and gone through all that has taken place, that we will be stronger than we have ever been before, that we will be more willing to serve you, that we will walk in love for you, and we will walk in love for our neighbors in a way that we've never been able to accomplish in our lives before. I pray, God, for, again, for the St. Peter Baptist Church, but I pray, God, for the body of Christ every church that is having service in the world, I pray, God, that you would use this as a time that we may stand up as bright, shining lights for a dying world so that out of all of this, the world would know that Jesus is Lord and God is, has all power and the only way for salvation to come is through Jesus Christ. I pray, God, that that would be the legacy of this season, that lives will be changed, that cities will be changed, that states will be changed, that nations will be changed, that the world will be changed, and the world will know without a doubt that God is Father and Jesus is Savior. Let it be so. We love you. We thank you. And we praise you. And it is in the wonderful name of Jesus that we pray.
Father, to the all wise God be power, majesty, dominion now and forevermore. Wherever you are, let's say together, Amen. Amen. Amen.